So good morning, good morning everybody. Thank you very much for coming today to this session of uh, Big Data for Human and Responsive Cities. We have a nice choice of speakers coming from Andorra, Korea, <laughs> the US and Switzerland. And uh, one of the problems in, in this area of big data probably is to find nice, interesting cases, uh, particularly cases that appeal to people and societies and have the capacity to bring action and change government. And probably this is what we're going to see today and in, in, in this presentation. So let's start. Let's start with uh, Mr. Jose Miser from the government of Andorra. And uh, well, uh, he's going to talk about us about all the developments that in Andorra are happening with big data since now, quite some years, in collaboration with MIT, I think. So it will be very interesting. <laughs> Oh, yes. Thank you. La presentación. Con más. Pues es aquí o play. Ah, vale. Yes. Y para pasar aquí, ¿no? So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to have the opportunity to explain the Andorran project today here. Uh, a vision that we had four years ago. It's a, it's a vision that we have to be honest, we, we didn't start thinking as Andorra making a big data project. We started to think as a vision that we wanted to create a real living lab in Andorra. We thought that being small as a small country was an advantage and we couldn't take advantage by uh, making things happen more faster than in, than in, all, in the other countries. That, that was the main idea, try to, to get a, a real living lab. So for this purpose, we have started developing these different strategies. It's obvious that you need a friendly administration because it's impossible to develop innovative projects if you don't have some changes in regulations, if you don't have some advantages, if you don't create the appropriate environment to make these projects happen. So we started working uh, this strategy. It was absolutely necessary to promote investment in Andorra. It's quite difficult to develop new projects in a tiny country if you don't have FDI for direct investment. So we started an ambitious program to get more investment. And then it's, it's clear, uh, you, you can bring investment, you can make all the regulations and change and necessary changes to develop this activity, but you need knowledge, you, you need people, you need entrepreneurs working in the projects. So we started working with our educational system from the very beginning, trying to make students create companies, create projects around innovation, and that's the idea of the Andorra. Some, some of the projects I would like to outline before I start uh, explaining you more in detail and giving you some examples of our big data, were a unique collaboration, for example, with Google. We, we, we did quite an ambitious strategy to promote all the country digitally, so uh, you can visit the, the whole country in the Street View technology, but we also extended this technology to business. 95% of the businesses of Andorra are available in the Google Business View tool, which creates a really interactive experience between the customer and the business. You can navigate through the business, so uh, this is a unique experience. Right now, we are working trying to offer more, more interactivity, more solution, in, in order that the experience between customer and business can, can get improved in a complete different way. Then, we also developed a project which was creating a persuasive electri electrical vehicle, which is an autonomous, drive, an autonomous vehicle. We don't want to test technology for testing technology. I mean, I think there are a lot of countries that are doing this. We just want to see how a vehicle like this one can change the way people behave during the day. Can we have real impact in the uh, in the day to day of our people? It's what we are thinking. And finally, the, the most important project that, and the one I wanted to talk was was the creation of an open big data. And I and, and I would like to line the word open because that's important. First of all, it has to be an asset for companies. I mean, we need businesses, we need companies that develop solutions, that create applications, that create services for our visitors and our citizens. So the first objective of our big data is not to serve 
as an analytical tool is to serve for companies, develop new solutions for our, visitor, our citizens and our visitors in order we can create a whole new experience for them. Then obviously we use it, we use it as a tool for, for the government, for example. We are a tiny country, we have a strong dependency in terms of energy, we have to buy every day 85% the energy we need. So as you may, as you may notice, uh, energy prediction is quite important for us. We have to be accurate because if we can buy energy cheaper, it's something that we take advantage of. So using the, our big data as an analytical tool for the energy pr prediction, we improve this prediction by 10%. As you can imagine, that's a huge investment for, for the company. Another example is this one. Here you see how people move around city center. That's the, that's a visualization layer of our, of our big data. Here you see in orange how Spanish visitors move, in blue how French visitors move. That's, an, uh, that's a single day in summer where, for example, uh, we are holding an event. We are holding the event of El Cirque du Soleil. You see a lot of concentration here of people in orange. That's, that's the Spanish people going to the event. So first conclusion, we, we can see that French people are not going to see the event. It's, it's only Spanish people that go there. That's, that's really useful because having a tool like this one helped us work with, with, uh, with the local administration before and after, and after the event. Because if we analyze how people behave, we can, for example, before the event, make more parking slots available. If we see where people come from, where they are looking for parking, etc., this is really useful. And then after the event, we can see how people uh, move or behave. If they go to a specific uh, region of Andorra, we can try to work with restaurants to make the offer of the restaurants available for them. So that's really important. I mean, uh, take this kind of uh, experience, this kind of uh, uh, analysis useful for, for the administration and improve the quality and experience of the, of the visitors and citizens. For example, another example, that's a profile of, of four major events happening in Andorra during winter. We have the free ride, we have the speed skiing, we have uh, the, the World Cup of uh, Alpine skiing, and then we have an event which is quite innovative. It's called Total Flight. If we analyze the event in a traditional way, I mean, if we look only to the attendees, that's the, the first column. If we look to the attendees to the event, probably you will see that the best event is the total flight. And, and the worst one or, or the one that brings less people to Andorra or visitors is the free ride junior. So that's a typical analysis, counting only people coming to see the event. When you, when you add more variables to the equation, I mean, uh, you used your big data to analyze what you are having in terms of profiling the, the event, the, the, the approach changes completely. Yeah, I mean, if, if we look at the last indication, and, and the last column, sorry, you're gonna see how many people is coming for the event, how many of these people is new, and they are revisiting us uh, the next three months after the event. So with this approach, the best event is another. I mean, if we are trying to get different people coming to our country, if we are trying to get people that comes often to Andorra, it's clear that the best event is another one. So that's a way we are using our, our big data. It's a way we are uh, getting more information, taking advantages, advantages of, of a deep analysis, and trying to have a real impact in people. I mean, trying to get the right decisions. So I just wanted to uh, give a quick shot of, of, uh, with examples. We have more, more information and more examples we can show you. We have a stand here, so you are free to come and visit us. We will be happy to explain you more in detail. And, and please keep this in mind. Our objective is to have a really good decision support system and have a platform for companies that can use this platform for develop services and applications that are real for people and citizens. Okay, so thank you very much for your, for your time.
Thank you so much, Jose Maria. Wonderful presentation. And incredible case, this one of Andorra, such a tiny country. I forgot to tell you two, two things. One is about questions. You have an app that is called Ask Bolt. So please use it if you want to ask any questions and so on. You can use the app. Also, after the presentation, we have some mics there, and then you can stand and ask questions. Both ways work very well. You just download the app, ask some questions, and then we will take care of it. Uh, but now, after Andorra, we have we go to the U.S. and then we have uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Badim Maktin, sorry, I didn't get your name yet, from Abidatum. And he's going to tell us about quite an interesting thing. In big data, normally we have static data, pictures, and then they are working in a completely different thing. They are working on time series and geolocated time series. And this is extremely important because many times you want to know the tendencies. You don't want to know what has happened before, but what is going to happen if the tendency changes. And tendencies sometimes change pretty fast. We have seen that in the US. I mean, Trump and Hillary and so on, and how tendencies and trends uh, create a new reality. And this is impossible to detect with this static data. So this is a little bit the new frontier. Thank you so much. Thank Up you. to you. So, um, hello, everyone. I am a CTO and partner of Happy Data. Habitatum is an analytical company, and uh, during the years of our uh, work with different uh, uh, countries, with different cities, we developed a lot of techniques uh, for working especially with spatial temporal data. Spatial temporal data is a data which has a spatial and temporal component. And today, I, I want to talk about how this kind of a data can be used to form a different cities indexing. So we are thinking about a city, it's not about like a numbers, right? We are thinking about cities as a process. So the current problem is that uh, we, we are collecting a lot of data that's not, not in use anymore, right? We are storing it. We are able to store it. But um, pre previous uh, talks was about how this data can be analyzed. By, uh, but by the word analysis, we understood machine processing. But in terms of meaning, we didn't get something new. So we, we still... Um, quite locked by the conventional maps, by the conventional charts, which somehow limiting out our understanding of a dynamic urban process. And as a solution, we um, went to a classical time geography. So basically, we took a Hegerstrand's uh, sp spatiotemporal cube. So this is a cube which has a spatial dimension as a map uh, and a temporal dimension, which goes upwards. And in, in this cube allow us to store a city's data as a number of maps, we, a, a, when which map, a, each map uh, can be associ associated with a different timestamp. This is a quite simple solution. I will show you how it looks here. So basically, each city is represented as a cube, which can be sliced, um, we, we can filter it, and look for any kind of a special temporal anomalies. So where the color is darker here, it's a more dense data, and where the color is brighter is less data presented in this special temporal region. So again, time goes upwards, and uh, at each period of time we have a different map, which is the same map but at a different period. We think this kind of a uh, solution solves different problems, but uh, I will focus on s some of them. The first one is anonymity. We think that uh, currently when we present uh, data as a scatter plot, for example, and when we transfer this data, we are passing so, uh, too much of metadata, which will open uh, a, a, a possible uh, vectors for a correlation attacks. So people can get this data correlated with, uh, I don't know, with Instagram of a person and check uh, uh, wh when this dot was at this location, at this location, at this location, so this is a correlation attack. So we can associate uh, a social network profile with a person on the map easily. Uh, it, it, there was a case in the US when people correlated an open taxi data set with an Instagrams of um, celebrities. Uh, the second thing is that uh, this kind of uh, standard allows us to move uh, to convert uh, different types of data into the same cubes. 
And this is quite simple. So if data has spatial component, so geolocation, and temporal component, these two types of data, uh, this, da this data can be compa uh, compared and um, somehow analyzed together with another data. And to achieve this, we developed a uh, solution which consists of a um, file format, which I will uh, talk a little bit about in next slides, and also an analytical framework which allows us to um, not only present a classical geographical data in the special temporal cubes, like people movements, um, business locations, and so on, but also we can wor uh, work with semantic data. We can present people's thoughts together with mobility data. So um, this uh, unified way of thinking allows us to simultaneously analyze a, a semantics of a city so what uh, places people likes and what which didn't. And also uh, we, we can see where these people are located. And the interesting thing is that we can compare this. So we can correlate a uh, mental model of a modern city with its transport model, which uh, creates completely different urban landscapes for analysis. Because the transportation is not only infrastructure anymore, Transportation is also uh, sentiments about it, about transport. It's, it's how the transport is comfortable for us or not. And this, this, this way of indexing um, is completely different from a classical tabular view because uh, cities are not numbers of indicators anymore. Cities are complex and they're temporal, right? So cities live in dynamic and when we convert the city into a static set of numbers, it hides a lot of its internal structure from us. So what we propose is to use this special temporal model to analyze not only what is happening in a series, but why it's, ha why it's happening and when it happens next. Thank you. And uh, if you need a live demo, of course, at our booth, uh, we can always show it to you. So this is why I'm here, actually. So thank you so much. Uh, remember our app for questions, if you want to have any question. Well, from the US, we go to Korea, uh, Professor Zhang Lee, uh, from Jonsei University. And I think you're doing pretty interesting things on around living labs and ecosystems in Korea. So tell us about. Thank you. Can you upload my slide? Yeah, okay, thanks. Hi, it's good to be back. Uh, last year, the, I was presenting about the IoT implementation in Korea, and there was some, uh, this year, again, the, the big data is a uh, big thing in right now in Korea as well, so I would like to share some slides uh, with you as well. So basically, we are entering into the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, we just doubles came out, this sort of uh, famous uh, word with that. The one key things, uh, key words remember is, is IoT, also the CPS, which is a cyber physical systems. So actually, the city has been involved uh, through a number of years from the uh, agricultural cities to smart city, and that's the way we see as well. Uh, the data becoming very, very important for the city data innovation as well. So somebody, uh, some people exposed already called the data-driven city is the kind of keywords that are going to be happen next uh, few years time as well. But also they rediscovering the, how the value is the, the big data value is uh, very important. And that becoming the kind of a uh, competitiveness of the city for the future as well. Uh, there are a lot of different kind of data types, uh, including the very social data to transportation data, and also the, in some cases, a lot of uh, CCTV data as well, and uh, also the sensor data. All these data have to be kind of collectively and then uh, uploaded into the, through the kind of platform, and uh, we are, that's the, what we are interested in, in, in to generate the data-driven city. I see from, you know, before the uh, smart city, uh, you know, open data is the very, very important aspect. But I think when we moving into the big data, there are three things that we need to actually have a look at it. One is the diversity and the utilizations of the, uh, how we're going to use this open data or open big data. And then also the, 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 the role of the data platform as well. So I'm going to go a little bit by one, one by one. 
These are the, uh, the services that are currently operating within the different cities. As you can see, the, I measure the density. Uh, we, are we are actually uh, finalizing the report of the comparing the 10 different smart cities with the different aspects as well. It's going to be each published at the end of this year in English version as well. So I probably, if somebody can, anybody can link, uh, link up uh, with me or send me email, then I will actually uh, send it a uh, copy as well. But you can see that you know, a lot of uh, services has been dominantly in the transportation and also the tourism or energy environment as well. Uh, but more and more, I see the uh, services actually came out from the geographical or kind of uh, urban spaces or this kind of a more likely with the uh, uh, urban kind of space information are uh, collecting it uh, through the uh, different kind, and then they actually transfer into the different kind of services as well. So the diversity of the services is uh, basically will be uh, creating the new value for the uh, smart city innovation as well. Uh, through that, obviously, the, you have to go through the, the source of this data will be the open data. Uh, as you can see, the, I compare the uh, 10 different cities with a different category of the, how they are actually arranging this kind of field. Uh, obviously, there are some cities are persuading looking at the real estate data. Uh, and also some some cities are actually uh, translating this open low data into the more useful data to uh, change into the uh, services as well. So this open data will be even uh, uh, larger and or expanding through the uh, also the uh, through the big data collections as well. Uh, there are some some example in Korea that uh, actually the uh, the if you look at the left side the public transportation trouble for example like night bus line was designed by the big data. Uh, basically, we look at the big data of the how people are traveling through the after the midnight, uh, and then after that we design the, actually the bus and how many number of stops and how many uh, you know the lines uh, where to go and things like that. So basically, through this kind of concrete big data analytic, and then we transfer into the more better service to serve the uh, uh, improving the citizen quality of life as well. Uh, also, though we are looking at the uh, real estate market analysis to see that the Seoul is a very high density area. So, uh, where we look at the, this uh, market analysis, that providing this big data to, uh, including the education and also the you know the the, the, the environment there as well. All these data are combining it and looking at the how this uh, real estate market is moving as well. Uh, so, as the environment is the same thing as well. Uh, so, we see the more and more. Uh, going to be collaborative, and uh, this can be achieved by the open platform. Uh, we see a lot of uh, cities are actually doing interactions between the different cities through the, this open platform uh, to sharing, and then maybe the collecting the data with the other cities with the big data, and the, they do the kind of analyzing together. Uh, so those kind of activity will be kind of emerge as a kind of new partnership model as well. Um, also, the the living lab program, as uh, Andrew was uh, uh, the, the was mentioning about this kind of living labs, uh, is a test bed will be emerged for the testing the this kind of big data and as, and living lab uh, will be play a very important role to actually supporting and creating the ecosystem for the big data uh, companies and startups as well for the city. Uh, again, the city engagement platform to is is very important. Uh, to use the, this kind of generating the what kind of big data services are used uh, and useful for the people as well. This is a case for the Busan, which is the second largest city in Korea. And we actually try to generate in the what kind of big data services uh, we require for the, uh, for the next generation of smart city through the, this kind of open platform. Uh, Seoul actually opened the uh, called the Seoul da Open Data Plaza website and also the Seoul Metropolitan Government uh, Big Data Campus as well. So we try to actually embracing the some citizens to use this open data and then uh, to become a kind of entrepreneur or maybe the resolving the some problems as well. And I think it's going quite well with the, this uh, analysis as well. Obviously, the center law of this kind of. Uh, uh, Big data is the, actually the play of uh, uh, the role of the smart city platform as well. Uh, through this uh, IoT and also the, especially from the transportation area, uh, this open platform will be actually play a critical role to actually innovate it into the big data innovation within the smart city as well. Obviously, there will be the cyber, cyber and physical kind of systems uh, uh, interactions, and obviously the collecting the data, 
uh, through the collecting data will be uh, have to be interoperable. Obviously, the 1M, 2M right now is actually linking the horizontally with the uh, different kind of sectors of from the transportation to energy and environment to education and, or vice versa uh, and so on as well. Uh, conclusion is I think the, the data quality management becoming very critical and also the open data provisions and to achieve these things or also the citizens uh, engagement is a very very important to generate what kind of useful big data will be serving for the next uh, uh, smart city uh, innovation as well so uh, you know we see the for example, like if uh, Seoul is implementing the uh, self driverless car, so if, if, if it's autonomous car, then maybe we don't need a space. Uh, maybe we can put the car parking facilities in outside of the Seoul area, only the, the people are carrying out. Then there will be the issue of the how we're going to use these urban spaces and retransform into the other spaces as well. So there will be the link between the, this kind of uh, urban spaces uh, transformation uh, through the using the big data analytics as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Impressive what is happening in Korea and, and so in other countries too. Remember the questions in Ask and Vote. Remember the, uh, to do to make some questions with the with the app and so on. We will take care of them later. And finally, we have our last speaker that is Barbara Flügel uh, from Switzerland. And uh, Marbella is, is the um, chief of, uh, no, the cross-industrial IoT transfer task force lead in SAP. And um, she works a lot in ecosystems and how to activate ecosystems with cities. And probably we will have very interesting insights from you. Please, go ahead. Thank you very much. So um, let me just see. Yeah, it's fine. So um, what I wanted to um, talk to you about is, um, the, on the one hand side, the topic of big data. I would also even call it small data, because um, at the one extent, we can have a lot of data. It can be really, let's say, put on 20 meter large screens. Um, but at the end, it must be or could be the small detail that really turns it into a smart data. And uh, what I call actually is urban analytics. It's not only about city analytics, it's about urban analytics, because our interest is in not only from one specific stakeholder point of view, what data, what is happening with the data, how it can be reutilized and uh, deriving um, decision-making processes out of it. It's really an interactive process from various distinct industries and stakeholders. Um, my name is Barbara Flücke. I'm working with SAP no, now for quite some time, and I work a lot uh, with um, cities, but also with industrial stakeholders and constituents together with a team on ecosystems assessments. So where we go into, into let's say, the DNA of a city, of a region, and how they uh, interact together. So technology, of course, for us is more than ever a key enabler, right? So the center prices go down. We know um, what can be saved in terms of business process automation. Um, we are, let's say, envisioning what the next generation of con uh, communications and connectivity generations will bring us when we think about not only sharing data, but also sharing apps. Let's say we're sitting all together here in this one event. Um, and we actually like to share the application, for example. And we like to actually share and, and con communicate about our interactions. And same is happening in cities, because as we are here in Barcelona, we also turn into temporary citizens. Let's say if one of us is losing the passport, the question is what is happening? How can we be served? So technology is there to enable and foster the digital life and citizen and the physical life from many, from many angles. So the starting points, however, are always contextual and they're manifold because every city and every region, and I always expand it to, to regions as well because we should not forget about the rural areas. Yes, there are the projections of the United Nations who will be living there and how many people, let's say, will, will remain in the cities. But what about the 30% in 2050 that stay in the rural areas? Will they not be served anymore? How can we predict what kind of, let's say, what the food logistics is about, what kind of medical services 
to be offered or will it be all digitized? So the starting point is always about the unique position of a city we're living in, we're looking at, or we're traveling to and we're visiting. And so it's about from going from challenges and constraints, and I listed here four of them. You can take it from a mobility and a transport perspective, but you can also take it from a provisioning of a healthcare service perspective, that on the one extent, there is a lot of data available, but what about the real-time uh, availability and the connectedness? What about the uncovered potential when it comes to real analytical processes? When you think about transport in the uh, area of cargo and goods, there's a lot of waiting time still. I work a lot also with ports, for example, where truck drivers have to wait. And the question is, how can actually a big data technology help us, let's say, to reduce and cut down uh, not only the waiting time, but also bring more energy into people's life um, if they already have to wait there and, 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 and actually serve for the next delivery? And very often, we still encounter, of course, isolated data sources. And there are new kind of data sources coming up. Might it be the textile of a shirt of a, of a bus driver's community, actually, that says, OK, something is going wrong. The, um, the heart frequency goes down. Is there, is there an incident or whatever happening? Is there a stress situation we haven't observed before? So we will have many new kind of data sources. We cannot even think about yet, uh, as I said, it could be the textile, it could be something else, like um, what can be measured. And it's about to ask the right questions. And this is why we conduct a lot of persona assessments and do customer journey mappings where we actually go and interview uh, constituents going on the street, but also going into the businesses and into the governmental stakeholders' businesses themselves. So the question is, how well is, for example, mobility being fulfilled in your region? what really needs to be changed, and how to create a livable and sustainable environment. So the scope actually is the one that's being derived from the contextual analysis, and not just for the sake of having big data and, and have a massive volume of data at that one hand. So here's an example how we actually structure when you have your vision for your city, for your region, or your business partner has and your governmental partner has, this is where everything starts, and this is why it's from the bottom there. So it can be that you say, okay, my vision is to be an ambitious city. We need to compete because we are in a competition with a neighborhood, right? We don't want to lose the businesses because they change their headquarters and move to another location. Or it's also about vibrant because we are more a tourism-related location, and we like to really create a great tourism visitor user experience. So this is what really drives the, 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 what you find on the upper level, uh, where you'd set your targets. And in some cities I encounter, the targets are well-defined. But the citizens go there, even the nations, the federal government says, we like to reduce greenhouse gases at this and this level. There are EU directives uh, in the space of mobility and transport congestion, for example, to decrease that. But there's, there is also the vision and the planning to say, we like to attract more and more visitors, more and more event participants. And this is why when you look into Barcelona's event calendar, you not only have the Smart Cities Expo, you also have the Mobile World Congress. And it was not always here. It was at, in one city in France, right? So, so what made the exhibitor, the organization committee change that? What really made it um, that Barcelona was the first and still is the first choice? And the competition is always ongoing. So that's one example. The fourth example here is about to reduce the container throughput. And you can think about what does it really has to do with data. Because in the container and the cargo business, you have an average for any export process, for example, and it's just for a normal good. It's not for a specific, let's say, hazardous or dangerous good transport. You have about 10 to 15 different stakeholders always involved. And right now, you still have about 20 to 25 business documents being processed even manually. So how can that actually be accelerated? Because more throughput means more trade. And more trade means more potential income and revenue that's being dragged to the city or the location nearby to the port or the airport. So, and, and this is when it comes to the middle layer where you said, OK, what are the city benefits? And I don't talk about solutions here and products. It's really about first identifying your identity you would like to have in a city or you like to pursue in the future. And there are different roles to be fulfilled. 
And local government is not only, let's say, a public sector stakeholder anymore. It turns into a service provider, into a service broker, into an aggregator. And this kind of role play, this is also what we actually conduct in our, in our approach. What you see here is, we are familiar with that. It's uh, United Nations Sustainability Development Goal number 11. So sustainable cities and urban settlements um, about inclusivity, safety, resilience, and um, sustainable business, and sustainable business be being brought to the citizen and the locations. And what you see here is, and you will also get the presentation afterwards, is about what we currently do in this space. So some examples about how we derive from the data um, the right kind of mix of service offerings. Because data only is, is serving well if we can distill and derive the right services for all the different stakeholders, like this, the businesses, the constituents, the visitors, the participants of an event, for example. So in urban analytics, here are some examples I brought you um, how to actually help foster um, big data analytics for urban ecosystems. And we don't have enough time to go through each of them, so I brought two examples. One is about, we heard a little bit about um, the housing part um, from the previous speakers. So you can go into problem properties monitoring and actually go firstly into what is my scope? What is the status quo I have in my location? And um, on the one hand side, technology helps to visualize first and see which building actually is at risk. Where is a certain event? Maybe it's because of a, a specific district. Maybe it's because there is kind of a people movements discovery going on. And there are also, let's say, for example, certain areas where you have, for example, 911 emergency service calls suddenly happening. And the question is how to really put that into a right correlation. And what we're also deriving here, what you see here, it's just exemplified, is about what are the major problems in some of the neighborhoods. Uh, are there specific stakeholders, peoples, or industries, for example, involved, or specific events? The journey analysis is about what you see here. Um, it's hard to read, but it actually visualizes the metro stations for the city of London. So what, what we actually did was, um, and this was done uh, by our data science team, to identify at which station would a person switch into another mode of transport, or is it the ultimate destination? without knowing the people. Because we like to do, of course we like to do business, but we also like to serve the unknown service, uh, the customers and the consumers. So how to reach out to the ones we don't know? And we might never know everybody who's in our cities and locations, but we still can derive certain patterns and movements and then distill and propose certain predictions and patterns and services and business processes. So in this case, it was about how to identify what modes of transport would people use and what modes of uh, transport would people use in case of an accident or an incident. And intermodality, when we look into the EU directive to go into one ticket, is about where we need to, of course, also calculate for the ones that operate these kind of services, what is the right business model and how much should the ticket, for example, cost. This also links a lot to the um, alliance what has been formed last year on mobility as a service, for example, throughout Europe, um, what we also see here. So what we see is urban analytics is a three-phase journey. On the one hand side, to explore, explore to identify the dependencies in the data, but also how to visualize and expose the processes. The second one is about modeling. So model the dependencies and processes and predicting then the evolution. So what is happening if we take the next and next step? And then preparing. And preparing really means to interpret what we are finding there. So how to derive and distill recommendations out of what we see there. And this is, from my perspective, mostly neglected in certain areas a lot. We always think what we see is fine. But what, is really, what does it really mean? What kind of business processes and recommendations can we take from there? So this is a very simple graphic of, of um, how we actually uh, work and engage um, running ecosystems assessment workshops. And in this case here, specifically focusing on urban analytics. 
So we go into like cities and locations and say, okay, let's bring different businesses, different industries in the governmental sector together, and then identify the contextual profile of a city. So what is apparent there? What kind of role, what kind of targets do you have for your location? And then derive from there. So it's not about going there and say, okay, we have a great big data analytics tool, whatever. It's really about identifying and determining first the position, your starting point. And then taking it from there and going into use case identification and prioritization. And of course, then subsequently the business modeling and the piloting phase um, is then happening. So that's about it. Uh, in a nutshell, we also have our booth there. And um, yeah, happy to see you there. And hopefully we also can get some questions then. Thank you. Thanks. Vielen Dank, Barbara. Sehr schön. Sehr nett. So let, let me ask you the first question, and then we'll start with all the other questions. I will ask only one, <laughs> I promise. <laughs> uh, ten years ago, more or less, uh, uh, this thing started in Chicago, then in New York, and then the Bloomberg administration created the data analytics office in the New York City. And well, now <coughs> every city wants to create a city, uh, an office of data analytics. And every business wants to be that driven, and every city wants to be that driven. Imagine that you were nominated the data, the chief data analytics office officer of your city. Which will be the first project that you will do, and why? You. <laughs> I think probably uh, if I'm the chief of our data analytic, uh, the first thing I need to do is actually the how you going to collect the data from the different sectors. So probably setting up the platform to collecting the all different sector because the big data is uh, again it will create a more value uh, when you actually combine the different sector of data. Uh, one area that probably I would like to pursue is uh, probably the transportation related with the health. Uh, that you know the Korean people is uh, you know taking a lot of public transportation but not having enough exercise. So maybe that's the kind of area that uh, I would explore. Uh, as a kind of a business model as well, yeah. So uh, I think I'm sitting in, in, in the right position because after acquiring the data, I think it's quite important to make it accessible. And when I say inaccessible, I'm not saying open because of course cities, cities data should be open, it's obvious. But right now I think we didn't get the term accessibility of data right because accessible data is not a, some kind of a tabular data sitting on the server uh, which uh, uh, allow it, uh, users to access it. But accessible data is a data presented for a city's uh, users. And accessible data is a data which is really easy to work with and to view it and to analyze it. So uh, I think that the data accessibility is not a technical term. It's more really a humanized term. So people of your city should be able to work with your data without any kind of technological exper experience. I think it's highly important. Yeah. Well, I think FEV's project is try to match what, what you're really trying to solve and the data you have. It, because if not, you risk try to get as much data as you can, and I think that's not the approach. The approach is get the few, data, the few data you can, but data that it's a quality data that helps you uh, resolve the specific needs you have. So that's exactly what we did. Try to see which was the appropriate data, the correct data, and try to get less data as we can in order to solve the, the needs or uh, the specific experience we wanted to create. So that's, that's I think, should be always the first project. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yes, as I said, um, I would um, first start like what we do already about um, what is the position, what is really the vision and the status quo. So there are two aspects. The one thing is what is the starting point, where are we at, what do we already know about um, the location, the city, um, and um, secondly about the vision. So you can be overwhelmed with data. So that, um, like you actually said, there there can be so much, and this actually can also blind us and, and make us blindfolded. So it's first to know about where are the key starting points, and without not knowing where to go, 
I mean, you can yet start the journey, but you will end up in a different place. And this is what you want to avoid, because it's also about efficiency here and being effective, because um, the third pillar is about to engage the various stakeholders and the constituents. So community engagement is also key in here. And I would actually also ask the citizens, this is what we actually do. So ask the citizens, the constituents, and the businesses what they are looking for, and then form it together into one vision and strategy plan for the location. No. Okay, wonderful. Let's just start with the questions that, that we have here. One is for you, to Josep, and says, uh, could you give us an example of a non-profit, but useful for citizens and visitors application of big data in Andorra? Well, I think, I think that, that the example I gave is non-profit. Well, it's profitable in, in terms of experience, but uh, what, what we are trying to do is increase the experience of our visitors. I mean, uh, we are not trying to get uh, any revenue, any profit about it. What we want to is try to take better decisions in order we can increase the experience in the world direction. I mean, if you can handle the whole experience of a visitor before, during, and after an event, that's something amazing because uh, you, are t you, you are adding value in every moment that the visitor is in your country. So I think that's non-profit. I mean, we, we are not trying to, to, to get money for, from it. It's completely different when I talk about that we are trying to get investment uh, in our projects. We are trying to get companies develop services in our platform because uh, here it's obvious we have to try to find or define a business model that it's comfortable for both sides. But, but our main objective, as I said at the beginning, is just try to increase the experience, but by uh, knowing much better our visitor. If we know much better the visitor that is coming to Andorra, what they need exactly, what they expect from us, I think we will uh, prob probably uh, will probably make this this person experience better the the country at the end. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. The second question is for all of you. Is it says how to prioritize. Uh, the type of how you make priorities with both the type of data and the applications. Uh, what are the criteria that you think will be put in place in order to prioritize the type of data that you are going to use and the type of applications that you're going to use? Uh, <laughs> so it's a good question. And I think there is no such thing as a priority of data in an analytical project. Of course, we have some kind of uh, informal priorities, like when we are developing a uh, transport analytics project, the transport data would be preferable, but it still need to be correlated with another data sources. And uh, as I told in my presentation, maybe not, not so deeply, uh, I think that uh, if we will be able to correlate different data sources, uh, in a single analytical model that will move us to uh, different insights because when we are moving uh, when we are thinking about the data it's about an isolated object without correlated, uh, correlating it with an urban context which is quite complex nowadays I, I think we are missing so much more insights well, I think um, sometimes, it's, let, let's face it, in projects it's difficult to prioritize. You, you do what you can mm -hmm. uh, sometimes. It's, it's, kind, uh, it's not so methodologically. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. from our perspective, there's a lot of research in the, in the project. So you have to try different sources no matter where they come mm -hmm. from. So it's, it's quite difficult sometimes to prioritize. What you try to do, or at least you try to do, is just try to get data that makes sense with the vision you have. I mean, if you are go working with the tourist sector, try to get data from, from, from this sector. Okay? That, that's our experience, at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the starting point first is like you are talking about the domain you're interested in. I mean, in Andorra, the case is about tourism. And you would like to increase the number, but you would also like to increase the user experience as such. So you start with a domain that is apparent for you or where you already have, let's say, identify your KPIs in your vision paper, what you like to improve, what you like to institu institutionalize, or what you like to envision for the future, where your future state is most likely to be. 
Uh, in some other cases, their priorities are given by the regulation or by the directives, right? So greenhouse gas reduction, let's say uh, certain uh, objectives and KPIs for German cities, for example. So do you have a choice? Mostly not. So this is where you naturally would start then in that case. And then it's about uh, going into and see, okay, where are, I would say, the low-hanging fruits, where you can, let's say, the most impact in a certain time frame because uh, otherwise you lose the momentum as well to the to the external stakeholders and the constituents and also to engage them in yeah i think the uh, the the slide i show you about the the trend service trends of the each different city when you look at it these patterns that what areas actually the cities are pr uh, you know taking a priority and from there they actually you can see the not only they're using the just only simple open data, but also the how this big data with the different, I mean, you mentioned about the correlations within different sectors can be linked together and creating the new value. Uh, again, I have a perception that the big data is about the creating the new value, whether that is the public or whether that is the private purpose. Uh, you know, that data source is going to be you know, very, very important to realize how people are uh, using uh, services daily and how they we need to reutilize in these kind of services as well. Yeah. So it really depends on the you know what you have in the services. And uh, again, the again the, the city has got a even their own strategy. Uh, the mayor leadership has got a own strategy with the, that priority agenda, and that should be one area that we need to look at it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, very related to this question, we have another one uh, that is very closely related. I mean, at the end of the day, all these applications is taxpayers' money. Is so we have uh, to be to watch out about what do we do with with the money of the taxes of the people and so on. So the the question is how can we calculate the return of investment on and, and justify at the end that this taxpayers' money is not thrown out of the window but is you say in proper ways and in sensible ways and so on. Uh, what are your insights on this? It's very delicate questions. I think the you know the. There was, you know, all smart city services. I've been looking at it for the last few years. That there was a debate about the uh, whether this is a public grievance, and you know, this is a, you know, instant, you know, payback for the, the taxpayers mm. uh, who's who's willing to do that. And there are some people that need to pay these things. Uh, there are kind of a contradiction contradictions between these things as well. But uh, I believe whether uh, uh, if this value becoming more impact in your life and not for the social purpose, then maybe actually the it is right for the private purpose. But if not, then they maybe the, uh, that can be a public purpose to using this kind of service as well. So it's very dozy questions that I don't have a really straightforward answers. But the way I see is that there each city has been struggling with these kind of issues that, you know, mm -hmm. what sectors are we going to do the public only not pay by the not done by the private sectors and what we can do. But I see in, in Asia cities, a lot of uh, government uh, driven, public driven services are launched, whereas Europe and the uh, United States are actually using by the private you know, engagement music as well. But now in Korea, we should use the kind of private engagement, uh, more and more private sector should come. Uh, I met some of the uh, uh, city people yesterday that they are also, they're thinking other way. Mm -hmm. that we should a little bit, you know, own the public kind of services as well. Mm -hmm. So there are kind of trend that, uh, you know, this mixture of these two. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we are talking about uh, top-down pro projects here, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, uh -huh. initiated by government. Yeah. So uh, I don't think that, uh, for example, in an urban renovation project, there is a thing called uh, returns in, inv in investments because... Uh, when we build a new parks, right? When we build new schools, how we can calculate it? But um, I, th I think there is a term called uh, lean planning. This is a planning uh, when you uh, build something and then check just how the system is evolving after you made your intervention. And I think this is a term which is quite suitable for this scenario. Because when we build a new park, when we build a new public space, we can use uh, the data, the open data, big data, small data, any kind of data, not just only to make our decision, but to control it, how it applied, and how it evolved. And I think this is our return in investment. It's not in money, but it's in 
It's in people's sentiments, in, in uh, urban growth, it's in transport infrastructure, it's in everywhere. It's just in cities' evolution. And I think after we apply some intervention, we, we need a tooling, uh, a way to think how to look at it, how to control it, and how to predict uh, how we can apply our further steps. Mm -hmm. Any ideas? Yes, um, well, yes, Con concerning business modeling, um, I would say, firstly, if you know about your city performance, and uh, what you have available in terms of your asset and the investment pockets, that's, that's the first thing to do, to get clarity and visibility and transparency about where you are, where you stand for. And when you accelerate to a certain extent on some of the areas, you might gain additional parts where you can reinvest in or where you can reutilize or repurpose what is available. On the other hand, uh, cities and local governments have a mandate. So the mandate is about to provide and create a livable, a sustainable, a safe, and a resilient area for the cities, but also for the businesses and the stakeholders. So it's a mandate. It's a, it's a given. It's, um, it's, it's something where you cannot have a choice. The question is, how smart are you in terms of, let's say, transforming the choice into the offerings? And uh, that comes to the point only when you have clarity and transparency, you know where to spend the money in. And then you also get the buy-in from the others. Otherwise, a citizen would, would say, OK, no, let's, let's vote against it. And let's actually form, let's say, an interest group that goes against what you want to decide upon. And then, then, you, then you create frustration, but also confrontation. And this is not about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, from, a, from a government perspective, that there's no sense in trying to see if we have a return of inve in investment or not. Uh, I think for us, at least for Andorra, what, there are two things that are important. First one is to have real impact in people. And I, I have shown you some examples that, real, that really uh, make us happy in terms that uh, we are doing well with this. Second thing, and, and really important, is knowledge generation. I mean, if you cannot take advantage of what you learn and then has a real, have a real impact in education, try to improve your education with the information you get, I think that's, that's a huge success for a government, and th that's what we are trying to do. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. We still have time for one more question. If any of you want to ask any question, we have a mic there. Anybody? No more questions? OK, let me ask you one final question. But very, very, very short, sure, because we are run off time. What is the best big data application in cities that you know of? Choose one. Only one per person, and with that, we finish. Application. The best big data project. The best big data. Well, obviously, Andorra. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, which one in Andorra? <laughs> well, I think, I think you should come to our stand, visit us, and, and interact with our city scope. We, we just built a physical model of the city scope in order you can have real interaction, and I think you're going to get really surprised about it. Mm -hmm. Next to our booth, we have, um, together with um, a local city from Baden-Württemberg, um, a smart light pole. Smart lighting is one of the key, let's say, initiatives many many cities actually are talking and dreaming about because it is actually not only of course providing the light but it also serves as a wi-fi spot as an emergency um, um, hotspot as well where you can actually have an e-call an emergency call button but also it serves as a data provisioning um, tool for sustainability data and measures for example so it's mm -hmm. next to our booth i'm sure you have many in <laughs> I, I don't. I think there is no 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 way to name like a best uh, big data project because uh, for for me big data is a myth. So it's uh, just an amount of data which can be applied uh, to something or cannot be applied. And uh, I, I think that uh, current um, uh, open data movement is quite important. It's over speculated, of course, but uh, it's it has. Uh, it's, it's, it has a good results across the world, and uh, I, I think there is um, what states are doing with the open data program is quite fascinating. 
I think the uh, I see when I look at the IoT and big data, the one of the big players here will be, I mean, from the private sector perspective, will be the I think mobile carriers or mobile operators. Uh, currently, the SK Telecom, which is the most the largest uh, mobile carrier in in in, in Korea, uh, they are actually working with the city to how this uh, city data, big data, can be combined with uh, this kind of uh, personal data to creating the new services. For example, like even the taking the exercise, you know, even they, you know, taking a transportation every day. So it's more going into the daily kind of uh, life style of uh, kind of big data analytic will be. Uh, will be most valuable for and useful, and sometimes people get, you know, not care about privacy if this data is really, really valuable for the for the for the their own goods as well. Yeah. So. Okay. With that, thank you so much, and I think it's the end of the session. Thank you very much. <laughs>